And conceptually, I'm very careful, or I try to be, to use the word war in a non-metaphorical way, to the extent one can use any language in a purely denotative sense. What do I mean by that? The United States declared war on cancer in 1970, when Richard Milhouse Nixon wanted to recreate the Surgeon General's reports on tobacco smoking. And very soon thereafter, of course, we had the war on drugs, never ending. On the left, we're more likely to talk about a war on children, for example. I think war needs to be understood in its more legalistic form. And so I choose to use it about specific armed conflicts between organized groups that claim to speak for sovereign territory. And similarly, when I think of civil war, that they are in a struggle over the ownership of a specific territory. Most of the civil wars in the period after World War II and decolonization were in some ways proxy wars between the United States and the Soviet Union and the People's Republic of China. Conversely, vast numbers of the civil wars of today are in at least nominally Islamic countries and are about Islamic battles over suzerainty within those territories. So that's how I think about it. And just back to the word civil for a moment, this has a long history in the United States where the teaching of civics has been a consistent and powerful element of education at all levels and where the idea of a republic is very much about governance by laws, but governance by laws that is internalized by people and expressed in their everyday conduct with one another. Uh, and that allegedly successful model was in many ways what the United States sought to export to decolonizing countries, lest they fall prey to the temptations of Maoism, Stalinism, or any other ism. I don't use the word war metaphorically yeah. for the reasons I've indicated, but I pay attention and try to do so respectfully when social movements do so, when feminists refer to a war on women, when transgendered people refer to a war on them, uh, when the left refers to a war on children. I myself would find it easier to talk about a war against indigenous people uh, because those things were declared and undertaken by the state. When it comes to slavery, uh, I would see that as an act of war. You know, the invasion of another country, the seizure of captives and their enslavement. To me, that is part of war. But I don't use it in a metaphorical sense because I see these things as being too loosely and easily deployed when they're about a very serious, deadly attempt, generally, to enslave and destroy the other. However, it's very difficult for me to run with that because, for instance, it seems to me that the United States and Britain in particular routinely use the war against fascism, uh, 1939 to 45 or 41 to 45, if you're a lazy American who couldn't be bothered for a few years, sorry, I couldn't possibly have said that. Uh, that war against fascism is the alibi for endless imperial excursions and incursions as a morally just act. And the supposedly successful post-war reconstruction of Western Europe was, for instance, crucial to the horrors of the post-Iraq invasion from 2003 on. One could go on, there are lots of other conflicts. So I am very troubled by the idea of there ever being a just war, even though for many of us, one could argue the Second World War was such a thing. So for me, it's a deadly serious engagement by entities representing or seeking to represent the state against populations, either their own or others, and involving both civilian victims, such as those enslaved or such as women sexually assaulted in battle, or uh, those who are affected by air assault, as well as direct combatants who are 
dressed in a uniform that says, I fight for this entity. Whether it's Chantal Mousse saying that the left can pick up on populism as per some of her interest in Peronismo, or Bernie Sanders or Donald Trump from supposed political polarities engaging in this idea of populism. Part of the idea is that charismatic figures, as opposed to constitutional arrangements, can incarnate the spirit indwelling of a people. And that is a fundamentally anti-modern belief where modernity's core assumptions include, amongst lots of good things and bad things, ideas of representative politics as being about that complex modern movement between differentiation and de-differentiation that comes with urbanization, with capitalism, with liberal ideals of freedom. And also comes with the idea of expertise. Anthony Giddens has this neat example, which is he gets into an airplane he doesn't know how it takes off. He doesn't know how it stays up. He doesn't know how it lands safely. But he is not theistic about this because he has faith in a set of rigorous protocols and forms of invigilation that generate the passage of and the creation of new knowledge from person to person so that the engineers, the architects, the pilots, the maintenance people, all those involved in the creation of everything from an aerodrome to a plane are the products in what they do of the rational transmission of knowledge that is available to anybody and that they have been properly trained as well as being put in a position to offer their own interpretations. Now, it seems to me that that is a core element of, of modernity. It is not the unique ownership of a priest or a shaman or a chief, or a Bernie, or a Trump. It is actually available to all, but it is communicated in formal ways. That's how you become a doctor, that's how you become a, a Slavicist, that's how you become a cable guy. So it seems to me that one of the problems that occurs with populism is the devaluing of formal knowledge. Mm. And this is a bit ironic for those of us who, after the Cold War, wanted to see a Cold War dividend paid out, a peace dividend paid out within and outside the United States, wanted to see, for example, transformations in what we called big science, because that was seen as a tool of the Pentagon in many ways. And we started to problematize the idea of an absolute truth in science. Now we're the people who are saying, climate change real, global warming is happening. All these scientists say it is, so it must be so. Similarly, the relativization of truth that was favored by a lot of Baudrillardian and other postmodern theorists in the 90s has been displaced by a horror at the idea of fake news, a sudden valorization of journalism as a profession, whereas journalism as a profession was an invention of the reform era on the part of media proprietors to avoid regulation. <laughs> that's how lots of professions operate. You know, they seek to become self-regulating in ways that they want to deny to those people working in the informal sector or those in the working class. I'm a doctor, I'm a dentist, I'm going to ensure that the funnel of people into the profession is narrow so my salary stays high. The appalling Rudolf Giuliani saying recently that there's truth and there's truth. He could have been a cultural studies person 25 years ago and many of us would have been applauding him. Now, a lot of us are claiming, no, actually, <laughs> there is a truth. It's just that it may be encrusted in lots of ways, and it may be conditional. So it would be a contingent denunciation of him, whereas it would once have been probably saying, get on board with Rudy, if not politically, then conceptually. So I think that it's very important on the one hand for those of us wrestling with populism to acknowledge that a lot of it is a neglect of some of the very valued and ordinary forms of modernity that we have faith in, that the I-10 will stand up most of the time. We don't know why, but we believe there are systems that enable it to be so. That when we engage in a denunciation of 
expertise of knowledge and so on, the anti-vaccination movement, for example, we are falling into an anti-modern trap. At the same time as we need to be careful that the new embrace of scientific knowledge by the left, the great example being climate change, does not involve a return to the idea of turn over the crown jewels to big science because we know how much of big science in the end goes through the hands of the Pentagon, bears the marks of the Pentagon and becomes a tool of war. One of the facets of the design of a lot of consumer technology is that the idea of being friendly to users has become quite a crucial aspect of design. And so that means that it's easy phenomenologically to identify with these objects and to become experts in them. What does it mean to be such an expert and how does that relate to violence? I'll give you a short example of the cell phone the smartphone. Well, what's its relationship to violence and how smart are the users of it? How knowledgeable are they? Do they know that it's likely that the coltan that is part of its central processing unit comes from a civil war in Congo in which hundreds of thousands have been murdered? Then these objects are shipped to the United States or Europe or Japan or increasingly to other parts of China or to India. They are used and then they are recycled again into the informal sector, rather like their origins in mining, where there are high levels of occupational health and safety and a ravaging of bodies in West Africa, in South America, in Asia. And if they know about all of that, which is great, do they think, for example, if they're Maxters, if they're Apple people, guilty, do they know that the 10 core inventions that make up an iPhone are all derived not from the seemingly singular, entrepreneurial, barely educated genius of Steve Jobs, but from the Pentagon? So one core aspect of the iPhone was invented by CERN in Europe. The other nine all come from different elements of the Defense Department, the defense establishment, different parts of the military, of the Pentagon normally working in tandem with universities. So the crock of nonsense that says these objects are entrepreneurial responses to demand is to deny the corporate uh, assistance given by the United States government in particular as an ordinary part of capitalist innovation and so-called entrepreneurship. Everything from the type of glass that's in them through to uh, the touch tone component is derived from potential or actual military applications. So an example of a technology that we might claim to be expert at, you know, give it to a three-year-old, they'll be able to work it out. The smartphone is a product of, one, the attempt to flatter, to masturbate the user and make them feel master, mistress, whatever term we use for technology. B, of a system of a labor process that is founded in slavery and rape, and then on down the chain, and three, in a set of design norms that are inventions articulated through the defense budget principally of the United States, and then handed over gratis to corporations. That story is very rarely told to us. It's not included in all the little bits and bobs that we get when we are opening a magazine. That sort of information is not what we receive in general when we are looking at buying a product, when we're evaluating that product, when we are, for example, uh, thinking about the nature of the cell phone. It's just not part of the story, but it's actually there, embedded, incarnate, the prehistory, and the post-user history. That, I think, is where the flattery given to us as users needs to be undermined and rethought. 